But this kind of submission is, is shameful, not because it's simply always shameful, so to debase oneself. It's an ignominy and a shame because it may very well be, I think this is w without question what Satan is implying here, it may very well be that God is not actually omnipotent. Would an omnipotent, would a truly all-powerful God actually doubt the extent of his own empire? In, in, in Virginia Woolf's terms, Satan is trying to look past God's bogey. He, he tries to get behind the, the highly theatrical, the, the, the culturally constructed illusion of, of God's power. And it, you, you can hear Satan saying, uh, well, so what if we lost? The important thing is, we may have lost this battle, but the important thing is, is that God revealed a terror of this arm, of our strength, a, a fear of the military strength of the rebel angels it's what's, is what was manifest in this war. God was so afraid of us that he actually doubted his hold on his own empire, an empire that he was only actually able to maintain because of good luck or something like superior military firepower. But certainly, nothing is grand and as absolute as omnipotence. It's an amazing, this is an amazing thing for Satan to say after his fall. Even the expulsion of, of Satan from heaven was not sufficient to pr prove beyond a shadow of a doubt the legitimate authority of God. That Satan is still able to doubt the legitimacy of God's, of, of God's power is a testimony to the complexity, I think, of the, of the analysis of of power in paradise lost. No power, not even God's power, can be irresistibly and indisputably proven. Satan refuses in this speech to deify the power of the conquering enemy. And in this refusal, Satan resembles no one so much as John Milton. John Milton, the, the political leftist who refused to deify the power of the English king, Charles I. Um, whom so many of his con contemporaries considered to be God's anointed. Um, John Milton, who wrote hundreds of pages of anti-monarchic propaganda until King Charles' head was safely severed from, from his body. Like, like Milton, Satan is in the business of demystifying power, uh, of exposing political or cultural power as something that is not simply inherently there or naturally there. Power is something, and this is what we learn uh, from a reading of John Milton. Power is something that is created by a human process of, of deification, a process of, of king worship, or a process of God worship, or book worship, or, or a process, for that matter, of, of poet worship. Now, later on in Paradise Lost, Satan comes to the conclusion that that old man in heaven who seemed uh, who had assumed the authority to issue all of those arbitrary decrees, Satan finally relents and concedes that he is actually an omnipotent God, and that that God actually is, or was, the omnipotent creator of all things. But despite this enormous concession and this realization, Satan is still justified, I think, in his cynical demystification of God's behavior before the defeat of the rebel angels. A and Satan complains now that God never bothered to demonstrate to the angels just how powerful he was. And so this is the last quotation on the, the handout. Satan again. But he who reigns monarch in heaven, till then, as one secure sat on his throne, upheld by old repute, consent, or custom, and his regal state put forth at full, but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. Satan's saying that before the war in heaven, God's power just seemed like any other king's power. A a as if God sat on the throne of heaven merely be because of the hum those humanly constructed reasons of, of tradition or of old repute or, or cut consent or custom. Now, alas for Satan, it turned out that God's monarchy was actually based on genuine, on genuine strength. It wasn't simply that God just happened to be wearing the crown and just happened to be sitting in the in the best chair. But in Satan's articulation of what we can think of as a dialectic of power and authority, he provides us with a useful analysis of the problems besetting any understanding of, of power. That the kinds of authority established by the bogies of tradition and custom 
and conservative tradition are not always distinguishable from the kinds of authority that are based on genuine strength. A a and even if we locate a source of some kind of genuine strength, authoritative strength, it's still usually possible, as it is for Satan, to argue that that power is really at, at, at base just the concealed product of custom, or what we would think of as cultural construction. To be a king, one need merely put forth one's regal state. One simply needs to act kingly. Now, I raise the matter of Satan's critique of God's power because the evaluation and the criticism of, of Milton, and especially of Milton's poetry, has hinged for a couple of centuries now on a related set of questions about, the, about this poet's power. I, is, Milton, is Milton powerful for the very straightforward reason that he's in possession of this tremendous uh, l literary strength, this unimaginable talent? Or, or does Milton only seem powerful because of the traditional religious values with, with, with which he is so intimately associated? Does Milton only seem powerful because he has the force or the strength of the age-old literary canon behind him? Does Milton only seem powerful because he's the very literary embodiment of patriarchy and, and masculine bias? Now, uh, and w I mean, it goes without saying that these are questions that it's uh, impossible for us to try to answer, uh, certainly now. But Milton lets us know later in Paradise Lost that, that Satan was wrong to embark on his dangerous deconstruction of divine power. Um, Milton ultimately is a, is a pious man and wants us to frown on Satan's critique of the Judeo-Christian conception of divinity. But, but Satan, regardless of Milton's ultimate dismissal of Satan's position, Satan's analysis of power, and of God's power especially, isn't that easily dismissible. A and that's not simply because Satan bears such a strong resemblance to Milton, as, as of course he does. Satan looks, I'm convinced, Satan looks ahead to us as, as well. Satan resembles us as readers, as we attempt to di dissect and to anatomize the power of Milton's poetry. And I go so far to say that um, uh, something like a satanic sensibility may be one of our best guides in our reading of, of Milton. It's Milton Satan who best prepares us, I'll throw this out here at the end of this lecture, who best prepares us to explore what we can think of, the la uh, of as the labyrinths of, of Miltonic power. He, he puts us in a position to explore that truly weird but undeniable process whereby the very word, Milton, the name Milton, stops referring to a particular middle-class Londoner who was born in 1608 and begins to embody the very essence of that strange and inexplicable phenomenon that we call literary power. So that's all, I, um, that's all of the content portion of this, uh, of this class. The lecture is over, but let me uh, remind you of a few things. Um, you must, before you leave this, uh, this lecture hall, s put your name on one of the sign-up sheets. Uh, maybe I have them here. Well, well I'll find the sign-up sheets and make sure that you have an opportunity to put your name on them. Um, if you don't, um, it's possible that some of our unbelievably distinguished DAs <laughs> will find themselves um, without a job. And, uh, for next time, um, make sure that you will have read, uh, at the very least, Milton's great poem, and he wrote, he wrote it when he was only 21 years old, um, The Ode on Christ's Nativity. Um, and, and read, of course, the other two poems that are assigned for the class, but we'll be focusing on what we call the Nativity Ode. Okay, that's it. <laughs>